Thank you again for being here. And, and now I'm going to switch over to my second role of the morning, which is to introduce this very fine lady to you, Kay Adams. It really is a great pleasure to be introducing our keynote speaker this morning. I was trying to find adjectives, and there are so many I could have chosen. But you are about to hear the fruits of the labor of a woman who is proactive, enterprising, and generous in heart and spirit. And I know many of you do know Kay and uh, understand what I'm saying here. Kay has an enormous array of achievements, and I'm just going to uh, go over a few of these. She is founder of the Center for Journal Therapy. She founded it in 1988 as a gathering place for journal writers and facilitators. She's been in private practice, specializing in journal therapy since 1993, which always seems like it was yesterday to me, the 1990s. And lucky for us, Kay joined NAPT in 1992 and informed me that this is your silver anniversary of your membership. So, <laughs> yes. And Kay became a registered poetry therapist in 2000, and in 2002, started a poetry journal therapy training program as a mentor supervisor, and built upon that in a very sumptuous and creative and proactive way in, nine, in 2008, when she launched the Therapeutic Writing Institute. Many of you know it as TWI an online professional training academy. In 2013, Kay started the Journalverse, an online membership community for journal writers and facilitators worldwide. She has convened three journal conferences, has authored or edited 12 books on writing and healing, including the best-selling journal to the self, uh, which has always been a bestseller on my list whenever I have been doing teaching. She has also uh, been the editor or author of Expressive Writing Trilogy of Collected Works, and I'm giving you the titles now, Foundations of Practice, Classroom and Community, and Counseling and Healthcare. And I hope the bookstore has all of these. Okay, good. Because we are going to have a signing at, right after Kay's talk. And Kay was also NAPT president. So not only did she happily join our group, but was president from 2001 to 2003, and has received several awards, very well deserved, by NAPT for distinguished service, outstanding achievement, and for her efforts in education, the Morris Morrison Education Award. Currently, Kay teaches writing and healing at an MA program, the University of Denver. I'd like to know more about that program. And your favorite poets are William Stafford and Mary Oliver. Are there others in the audience that agree with that? <laughs> OK, those are favorites of a lot of us. I'm just going to add one more thing. Years ago, Peggy Heller had the wisdom and foresight to invite Kay Adams into our community. And we are grateful for Peggy's wisdom in doing so. For the marriage of poetry therapy and journal therapy has been a compatible and fulfilling experience. We are deeply grateful for Kay's presence in our community as a leader, educator, and creative force. Thank you, Kay. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And thank you, friends and colleagues, for being here. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today at my 25th anniversary celebration. Um, this is my 23rd conference in 25 years. I've had to miss a couple, but I, it's, it's my annual check-in. Uh, this is my other family. I have some of my actual family here. My sister Susie is back here. She's very short, so you can't see her. And, <laughs> and my nephew Tom Aury is um, a videographer, self-employed videographer, who is uh, 
uh, recording this uh, talk. So thank you, Tom. We've already seen the show of hands, or the stand up for the first time attendees, but I was sort of like, I, I couldn't see all of you. Could you just raise your hands again if you're a first timer? Look at this, this is so fabulous. I love this. Um, my first conference was about this size. There were about 60, 65 people at that conference. And I remember individual moments of feeling like I was going to levitate from the creative energy in the room. It just knocked my socks off. And so I just welcome you and have a wonderful, wonderful time. I, it was Perry Longo's first conference too. And uh, we buddied up and said, oh, I, I don't know what's going on. Do you know what's going on? I don't know what's going on either. So we had a, a great time. We went to a Cowboy Junkies concert in Boston. <laughs> I dragged her. I, I got two tickets because my favorite band. And I got two tickets. I thought, surely I'm going to meet somebody that wants to go to a concert with me. And if not, I'll go by myself. And I met Perry, and she went with me. We had this adventure, and it was just lovely. So you could be, if you're a first timer here, you could be meeting people this weekend that will be your friends for the next 25 years <laughs> and going. Um, I want to give a special acknowledgement before I forget to do this to photographer Aaron Spong, a lovely gentleman in Firestone, Colorado, whom I've never met, but whose work, um, as I was researching photographs for this keynote, was so compelling and so extraordinary that I just decided I wasn't going to even try to track down permissions anywhere else. I just emailed him and said, can I use a whole bunch of your pictures in a, in a slideshow that's also going to be videoed? And, and, and I'm happy to you know, make whatever disclosures or acknowledgments or whatever you want. And he wrote me back and said, oh, that would be great. Thanks. <laughs> so um, I, I really appreciate him. You're going to appreciate him, too. And his work is available online. There's going to be a slide at the end. Um, and there's one, we're going to have a raffle. And one of the raffle things is uh, a framed print of one of his, I'll, I'll, I'll cue you when it comes up. I think it's likely that most people at this conference understand the power of poetry, writing, literature, language, for healing, growth, and change. Many of us have experienced our own healing through literature and writing. Many of us are pulled to share what we have experienced with others by taking poetry or writing groups or workshops into our own communities, at the library, the yoga studio, the shelter, the church, the temple, the mosque. Educators, therapists, and healthcare professionals take the healing aspects of poetry and writing into classrooms, group rooms, hospital rooms. We yearn to surrender into the power of this work and create a sustainable living as a facilitator of these healing arts. Yet there are precious few advertised jobs for poetry facilitators or therapeutic writing specialists. The climb feels steep and scary. My talk today uses the metaphor of Colorado's 14ers, mountains that rise to altitudes of at least 14,000 feet. That's 2.7 miles vertically straight up, if you could just go straight up. So imagine. To explore what we can learn from the hikers who take on the risks and rewards of such challenging climbs. And if facilitating poetry or therapeutic writing isn't your particular mountain to climb, I invite you to adapt the metaphor for whatever passion calls you to the quest. The underlying principles are the same, no matter what vista you seek. As to my own 14er, I bring to this conversation a 32-year career as a self-made, self-supporting, full-time solopreneur. I've made my living facilitating and teaching expressive and therapeutic writing. I've been able to sustain a career in this work and create a life made by hand for more than three decades. Theologian Frederick Buechner describes calling as the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. The place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. My deep gladness has been reflected in the mission of my company, the Center for Journal Therapy, which is to make the healing art and science of journal writing accessible to all who desire self-directed change. 
It's been an uphill climb, but in between and all along the steepest and most stormy parts have been wildflowers, icy lakes, blazing golden autumns, sunrises, and oceans of Colorado sky. Those are also part of the path. As I was preparing this talk, I found myself quoting lines and even stanzas of William Stafford's poem, A Ritual to Read to Each Other. I could almost feel Stafford poking me in the ribs with his elbow and saying, hey, this poem is a ritual and I want you to read it to each other. So here we go. <laughs> a Ritual to Read to Each Other. If you don't know the kind of person I am, and I don't know the kind of person you are. A pattern that others made may prevail in the world, and following the wrong God home, we may miss our star. For there is many a small betrayal in the mind, a shrug that lets the fragile sequence break, sending with shouts the horrible errors of childhood, storming out to play through the broken dike. And as elephants parade holding each elephant's tail, but if one wanders, the circus won't find the park. I call it cruel, and maybe the root of all cruelty, to know what occurs, but not recognize the fact. And so I appeal to a voice, to something shadowy, a remote, important region to all who speak. Though we could fool each other, we should consider, lest the parade of our mutual life get lost in the dark. For it is important that awake people be awake, or a breaking line may discourage them back to sleep. The signals we give, yes or no, or maybe, should be clear. The darkness around us is deep. William Stafford. I want to share a few fun facts about 14ers, as we call them in Colorado. We have 58 of them, ranging from Sunshine Peak at a slim 14,001 feet to towering Mount Elbert, standing at 14,440 feet. Our most famous 14er is Pikes Peak, whose purple mountain majesties inspired this poem and song, America the Beautiful. In Denver, you're one mile high. And even at this elevation, you may experience a mild case of what we call altitude sickness, the symptoms of which are fatigue, headache, and low energy. The remedy is water. Drink a lot of water, seriously. That is the thing that will help you not feel fuzzy while you're here. Drink water. I am a child of the mountains. I was born in the shadow mountains of Washington State, then on to Idaho's Boise Mountains, and later to the Wabash Mountains outside of Salt Lake City. The summer that I was eight, my family permanently settled in the western suburbs of Denver with the constancy of the magnificent Rockies. Post-college, I spent six years in Tucson, where I was surrounded by mountains on all four sides. So I have lived my life in the presence of the mountain and all that it stands for, and mountain energy has shaped me. In her book, Reclaiming the Wild Soul, about landscape as archetype, Mary Reynolds Thompson writes, they soar to snow-capped peaks and slice the sky. They are anchors and icons and sacred places. Visible from miles around, the highest peaks give us our bearings and our need to aspire to great heights. Imagine a world in which you never reached for a vision. Imagine a world without dreams. Life in the mountains is a grand adventure. Filled with risks, challenges, and even setbacks and sacrifices, the mountains give our lives a heroic edge. Here, we thrive under pressure. We are not afraid of claiming our destiny. Now let us move on to the wisdom of the mountains and the climb toward making a living and a life made by hand. We'll do these in the three stages of the climb that correspond to phases of development that might predictably contribute to success in whatever endeavor you choose. The first section is on the ground. 
Respect the mountain's integrity. Every hiker knows or quickly learns that approaching the mountain as a force to be conquered is sheer folly. The mountain is the mountain. It stands in its power. To fail to respect its integrity can lead to devastation. When I ask people to tell me how poetry found them or when they started writing, most of them tell very particular and also universal stories about the way that writing or poetry offered sustenance and guidance in a time of need. Light in darkness, internal wisdom, a guiding fire of resilience. All of the stories seem to be woven together with one glowing thread. Words on paper created a portal into a world of possibilities that could be not just imagined, but explored. This is the integrity of the work that we do. I first felt it in the very first four-week journal class that I taught in 1985 to six friends who sat on my living room floor. I remember the feeling still of being humbled by the depth of stories that were emerging and my commitment to doing the work in the best possible way. This has required my commitment to my own integrity so that I can teach and mentor and counsel in ways that demonstrate accountability, authenticity, and appropriate right action. Develop an intimate relationship with the integrity of the field of expressive writing. The people who are attracted to this work are consistently generous, heart-centered, soulful, alive, creative. There is a genuineness and authenticity that permeates the work of poetry and journal therapists and facilitators. We genuinely love the power and potential of literature and writing as portals to healing, growth, and change. When you bring your own integrity and best practice to this work, we collectively create a force field, a mountain of strength and solidarity. We have spaces up here if you want to come on up. <laughs> Go to ground school. My first book, Journal to the Self, opens with this little story. A friend of mine went on a three-month hiking trip through Nepal, and even though she was an experienced mountaineer with years of training behind her, she was required to attend six weeks of ground school. What could she possibly learn in hiking ground school? Oh, everything, she casually replied. You know, the basics. The intent of hiking ground school is to ground a hiker in the bedrock of mountaineering success, which is to know the basics so thoroughly that they will become reflexive. Even for experienced hikers, ground school can be the difference between a safe climb and illness, injury, or worse. A long time ago, in a different century, at a conference just like this one, I began training to become a registered poetry therapist with Peggy Heller and Ken Gorelick as my mentors. Even though I was already a therapist, and even though I had found my own way into the theory and practice of journal therapy, I needed the shaping, honing, and discipline of advanced training. I learned about literature as healing agent. I developed a library of hundreds of healing poems. Sitting at the feet of masters, not just Peggy and Ken, but also Nick Mazza, Arlene Hines, Sherry Ryder, Jerry Chavis, Art Lerner, Jack Leedy, and so many more. I learned the art and craft of a well-planned and well-facilitated group or individual client experience. The arc of my life changed with the decision to undertake training. It was among my best and most durable choices. I live at the effect of it every day. And of course, training never stops. The reason many of us come to NAPT conferences year after year, decade after decade, is because this is our annual ground school. We need this conference to keep the saw sharpened, to have vibrant conversations about the kind of person I am and the kind of person you are, and how poetry and writing feed and sustain us, excite and energize us, soothe us, inspire us, ground us, in community, passion, and delight. Say yes. 
One of Denver's treasures is motivational speaker Joe Saba, now well into his 80s, who says, you don't have to be good to start, but you do have to start to be good. <laughs> Every mountaineer has had to say yes to the first mountain, to lean in, grab the rope, or plant the pick, and begin the climb. Everyone who wants to make this work their life and their living has to say yes to opportunities that seem to come from nowhere. The very best news about this first yes is that whatever it is, a talk, a group, a workshop, an in-service training, you'll never have to do it for the first time again. On the other side, you'll be experienced. You will have taught yourself valuable skills. You'll likely feel more purposeful and passionate, more determined to make it happen, to take this work to more and more people. You may begin running mental movies in which you star in bigger and bigger roles, writing a book, teaching at a university, working in a hospital, bringing poetry and writing to homeless shelters, refugees, traumatized teens, veterans, those with cancer, caregivers, the bereaved, the betrayed, the voiceless, those who cling to hope. Say yes. This time last week, I was with many colleagues, including India Radfar and Perry Longo, um, and 500 other expressive arts therapists in Los Angeles. India, a certified applied poetry facilitator, was on the faculty of a half-day session of writing and activism, as was Perry and the entire expressive writing faculty. We wove it together. India told stories about how she not only said yes, but got agencies to say yes, to sponsor her and fund programs for girls in detention, homeless veterans, and other at-risk populations. India takes risks every day by saying yes, and her risks turn into grants and groups. Between the comfort zone and the chaos zone, there is the stretch zone a zone of acceptable risk that will expand your view of what you are capable of doing. Within your own scope of practice, say yes to the opportunities that teach you how to lean into the mountain, how to trust its rock-solid strength to hold you. Pack a first aid kit. The basic emergency kit for hikers includes appropriate footwear, rain gear, extra food and clothing, water purification kits, a pocket knife, a headlamp, a map and compass, a first aid kit, and a pack to hold all the gear. Before you ever set foot on a trail, you are ready to respond to a predictable set of possibilities. How is your emotional emergency kit? Your backpack should have at least a dozen self-soothing strategies that are known to be reliable for you. And this is a little journal assignment for when we're, you know, somewhere else. Make a list of at least 12 self-soothing strategies that you can regularly practice. Mine include working in my garden, writing in my journal, taking a walk, reading poems, calling a sister or friend, going to the gym, reading a good book, hand building something with clay, and silence. If you haven't recently taken inventory of what recharges your batteries, make a radical self-care list and practice it regularly. In fact, challenge yourself to do at least one thing from your list at least four or five times a week. The next phase is starting the climb. Have a good guide. Hiking clubs abound in Colorado, and nearly all of them have expert guides who plan the hike, make sure everyone is properly equipped, and oversee the safety of the climb and descent. Similarly, we are wise to choose good role models, teachers, mentors, and supervisors with whom we can begin the ascent to the top of our professional field. When my destiny came calling in 1985, the only other person I knew who was teaching journal writing workshops was Eiko Michi, who, from whom I took my first intensive journal workshop in the Ira Progoff tradition. After my first Write On class, it was the 80s, now it's Journal to the Self, I wrote Eiko a letter and asked if she would consult with me on my fledgling work. She graciously agreed, and I paid what at the time felt like an exorbitant sum of $60 an hour 
to talk with her on the phone about my questions, insecurities, irrational passion, and the path ahead. What I remember from those intimate conversations was not guidance on the work itself, but the carving out of my own philosophy and spiritual approach to the work. And I will never forget and have frequently shared one stunning bit of advice. It is a foolish woman, Aiko told me, who does not win in her own fantasies. <laughs> it is a foolish woman or man who does not win in her or his own fantasies. Find good guides, people who have been where you are and who are now seasoned hikers. And don't be afraid to approach experts. My early teacher, Robert Fritz, once told me that what looks like genius is often experience over time and process. Particularly in the field of expressive arts therapies, there are shared values of service and generosity and in most cases, a refreshing absence of ego. As Marge Piercy said in the Seven of Pentacles, reach out, keep reaching out, keep bringing in. This is how we are going to live for a long time. Rope together. There are climbs that require community, not just for companionship, but for survival. Many mountains cannot be climbed alone. Some faces or facets require roping together, physically becoming part of a human connection in which each person is responsible for the safety of the whole. One must at all times be prepared to plant the pick or anchor the rope or shout for help. Each group member's response in emergency is the difference between survival and disaster. Particularly at this most urgent time in our collective history, we cannot fail to internalize this metaphor. We are living in dark times. The darkness around us is deep. As poets and writers, we light candles. The world needs us more than ever but we can't possibly do this work alone. We need each other more than ever. It has only been in my adult lifetime that writing communities such as NAPT exist. Many of us know Sherry Ryder, who is a contemporary of those of us who've been in the field for a while. She was a social work graduate student when she took her place as a pioneer in this work alongside Jack Leedy, Arlene Hines, Ken Gorelick, and so many other first generation NAPT and Federation leaders. We are here today because of them and because of Jerry Chavis and Barbara Kreisberg and Allison Johnson and Karen Van Meenen and Nick Maza and all the other hardworking members of the NAPT Board of Directors. As we are learning painfully in our shared national experience, freedom isn't free. Democracy is not a guarantee. Communities can grow fallow. If you are not a contributing member to your community in an active and present way, you are putting your community at risk. It needs all of us. I spent 17 consecutive years on various volunteer boards in the poetry therapy universe, the NAPT board, certainly, but also the boards of the foundation and the federation. Those years and that service changed my work in profound ways. You don't have to sign up for 17 years, but do considering offering what you can. Volunteer for a committee or bring any special services you might have. We can use all of it. Stafford says it is important that awake people be awake. We must rope together in writing groups, in poetry circles, in classrooms and coffee shops, at conferences, on committees, on faculties, all of these Connections bind us to each other and weave the power and promise of the whole. Last Sunday in the Writing as Activism workshop, NAPT or Ingrid Tegner spoke of the power of community activism using a part of Marge Piercy's poem, The Low Road. Ingrid's selection ended with these lines. It starts when you say we and know who you mean and each day you mean one more. Imagine the view. Hikers are constantly visualizing the view from the summit. 
It helps with morale, it provides motivation, and it is a reminder of why they are scrambling up a rock face. Back in the 1980s, I studied with Robert Fritz, creator of a system of vision and manifestation that he called Technologies for Creating. In my advanced class, I set a practice big vision that I would discover my life's work. In the third month of the class, through a seemingly random set of circumstances, I taught my first journal class, and it was immediately apparent to me that this was it. The Fritz model became part of my way of being. I used the visioning tools and methods to create everything I did, retreats, classes, books, and entire school. Fast forward 30 years when Deborah Ross began simultaneous studies at the Therapeutic Writing Institute and at Dan Siegel's Interpersonal Neurobiology Program. Deborah combined the two fields to create her life's work, a writing program called Your Brain on Ink, which was informed by the Center for Journal Therapy's mission to bring the healing art and science of journal writing to all who d desire self-directed change. Deborah adapted that and began referencing your brain on ink as a form of self-directed neuroplasticity. As soon as she articulated that, I realized that Fritz's work was also a form of self-directed neuroplasticity, and, after, and by visioning all those years, I actually changed my neural pathways in the direction of my own first imagined and then manifested success. I can't overstate the power of having a clear and compelling vision for your own success. The creative and integrative process of writing amplifies the power of your vision through articulation, bringing the vision to life on the page in a way that can be referenced continuously. Writing makes a vision known, makes it accessible, offers a starting place for context and a coherent, consistent narrative. Have a vision and anchor it into bedrock so that it doesn't falter. Then move in the direction of the vision, always being mindful of vision's counterpart, current reality. Know where your feet are. Every hiker learns quickly about dreaded scree, the mix of gravel and loose dirt that will send you sliding on belly or butt, hopefully not over the edge. It can't be avoided, but it can be managed by knowing at all times where your feet are. Mindful steps give you constant awareness of your current reality. In Robert Fritz's parlance, current reality is the tension point opposite vision. It is the constantly changing now moment. Oftentimes we live at the effect of current reality, exhausting ourselves attempting to avoid, control, or manipulate it. Fritz says that a more effective strategy for current reality in relation to vision is to simply notice it without attachment, since it is sure to change. Then, with vision solidly anchored into that bedrock, current reality can move in the direction of vision by taking a step, any step, in the direction of the vision. Sometimes we can change our current reality by confident and sure-footed steps. Other times, such as when we're uncertain of the scree, we take smaller and more deliberate steps. Always having a sense of your current reality is an excellent strategy for moving in the direction of your vision. Have fire starter. Matches and other incendiaries are standard protocol for the hiking emergency kit. Fire keeps you warm, cooks your food, and sends a signal. It is a hiker's best friend. The professional development equivalent of Firestarter is a solid marketing plan. This is one of the hardest hurdles for those of us in the helping professions. We don't want to market our work, we just want to do our work. Can't we simply emit positive poetic vibes and let people find us? Probably not. But take heart. Marketing doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to cost a whole month's earnings to get started. The biggest shift a solopreneur can make with the marketing bugaboo is to shift your mindset from selling your service to sharing your story. You know the power of this work. You know how it has helped you. How are others going to know if you don't tell them? Here's some good news. Sharing your story is one of the most reliable ways to let people in on the power of poetry and expressive writing. And we poets and writers are excellent storytellers. 
Here's some even better news. There are so many marketing strategies that you don't have to do things you hate. Can't stand public speaking, but you're a great networker? Ditch Toastmasters and go with conferences or networking, networking events where you can meet and chat with lots of people. Does the idea of cold calling leave you cold? Don't cold call. Ask your current students or clients to refer you. Take any small steps in the direction of your vision and you might be surprised to find out it's not that hard. The last fire starting idea I will leave with you is a small poem written by my friend Carl Callensrud. He shared it with me one day long ago when I was having a marketing meltdown about following up with people who had already told me they were interested. He said, Kay, take a deep breath and just remember this. Some will, some won't, so what? Who's next? <laughs> the third phase is ascending the summit. Blaze your own trail. Sometimes on a hike, when you least expect it, the trail disappears. You're on your own. Respecting the integrity of the mountain and its ecology, you must be prepared to make a trail where there wasn't one before. Or, in the words of Henry David Thoreau, do not follow where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. If you're waiting for someone to call you up and offer you a job as a poetry facilitator or a journal therapist, you might be disappointed. <laughs> in 32 years, it did happen to me once, but only once. I do, however, get quite a few invitations to teach, speak, and consult, and that's mostly because not having a trail has never stopped me. I just bushwhacked until I got somewhere interesting. Particularly when you're starting out and getting established, don't be afraid of pro bono work, unpaid work that offers service, often to audiences who might not otherwise have them. My clinical supervisor at the hospital program where I was a journal therapist left to direct the HIV AIDS program at a county hospital. She asked if I'd be willing to do a writing group for the guys back in the days when an HIV positive diagnosis was an almost certain death sentence. She said it would be grant funded. I eagerly agreed and prepared a 10 week arc of sessions. A few days before we were scheduled to start, she called me and said with deep regret that the grant money, the grant had not been fully funded and since I was the last program to be added, I would be the first to be let go. The guys were all really disappointed, she said, but they just couldn't pay me. I said, let's do it anyway. I'm ready, the guys are ready, let's just do it. That 10 weeks of pro bono work led to a grant funded writing program that lasted 13 years. Pack your trash. Every hiker knows to take sacks to hold refuse because it is an abiding principle to leave nothing on the mountain. It's a code of honor. Likewise, make it a code of honor to account for yourself when you are wrong and make it right. My first job out of graduate school was an evening shift counselor on the adult unit of a freestanding psychiatric hospital. My charge nurse was a gruff Vietnam veteran. He had spent his tour of duty doing psychiatric interventions on the battlefield. On my first shift, in the midst of an overwhelming litany of procedural teaching, he suddenly narrowed his eyes and glared at me. I'm gonna give you a piece of advice and I don't want you to forget it, he growled. I began to shake. Clean up your messes and don't burn your bridges. You're gonna be running into these people for the next 30 years. I followed his advice. Cleaning up my messes, making it right, whatever it takes, and not burning my bridges have been primary success strategies. And he was right. I have been running into these people, patients, doctors, and co-workers for the last 30 years. Stay attuned to the weather. It is often surprising and even harrowing for rookie hikers to realize how quickly storms can build and spill over the Rocky Mountains. The wise hiker will not only be prepared for weather changes, but will anticipate them. Similarly, frequent environmental scans for your business can serve you well. This is not only a frequent checkup of the mechanics of your business, the ratio of income to expenses, the outcomes of your marketing efforts, but it can also take into account what the social and cultural trends are. Right now, in April of 2017, the opioid crisis is getting a lot of attention. 
If you are one who works in the chemical dependency field, there is an opportunity here. You could educate yourself on the specific needs of opiate users, gather a set of poems or writing prompts that speak to the particularity of their pain, and slant your work to an entirely new audience. Sometimes the weather is changing right before our eyes, but we fail to take notice. I woke up Tuesday morning and looked out the window and went, oh, there's a foot and a half of snow in my yard. It was predicted, I didn't pay attention. Last year, I produced a national journal conference at a retreat center outside of Asheville, North Carolina. Some of you were there. The last time I did a journal conference was 2008, and we sold out an entire Sheraton hotel with 357 participants. This time, our venue size limited us to about 250 people, and based on past performance, I expected we'll sell, we would sell out. As it turned out, the conference had an attendance of only half that much, 120 people. The writing had been on the wall. I knew six weeks in advance that the projections weren't likely to happen. Had I remembered to do an environmental scan six weeks out, I could have reduced my budget, consolidated some expenses, and slimmed down the spending. <coughs> Instead, I had an exquisitely beautiful small conference, exactly the right size, with large conference expenses. <laughs> now I remember to keep an eye on the weather. This is the print that will be available um, for the raffle. Know your patterns. This is Maroon Bells near Aspen. It doesn't take long for a climber to learn what their particular skill sets are, and they use this information to guide the routes and even the peaks they choose. Hikers are aware that they have patterns of success that are reliable and predictable. I would guess that just about every person in this room could describe the predictable patterns they go through when they're about to mess up. When a relationship is failing, or a new job isn't working out, or there is a financial risk that didn't, isn't paying off, or even a diet. We are intimately familiar with our patterns of perceived failure of what doesn't work for us. Why then should it come as a surprise that our patterns of success are every bit as predictable, reliable, and not mysterious? One of the steps in my success pattern happens at the very end, just before I am about to succeed. I have a very specific event that I call my freak out stage. <laughs> I get almost to the end and then no matter how well I have prepared or how ready I feel, I go through an interval of time, a few hours or a few days, in which I put myself through a heinous process of self-doubt. For this talk, for instance, I had a freak out yesterday about whether the technology would work. I have a double backup system today with two computers on standby, just in case this one and the second one crater in the middle of the presentation. <laughs> it's just what I do. I learned long ago not to judge it or avoid it or try to manipulate it. I am so accustomed to my freak out stage that I now embrace it, recognizing it as a signal that based on my success pattern, I'm just fine. <laughs> At 14,000 feet, risks become rewards. The view from the top is the aphrodisiac that keeps hikers climbing. That exhilaration, that sense of conquest, that incredible rush of against all odds, I did this, makes the hardship, the challenge, the pain and exhaustion worth it. Risks become rewards. For the solopreneur, the view from the top may be fleeting. As the Zen proverb goes, before enlightenment, there is chopping wood and carrying water. After enlightenment, there is chopping wood and carrying water. I've learned that for me, the best response to the 14,000 foot view is to take it in, give humble thanks for the process that got me to this point, and then get back to work. To summarize our 14 er strategies for success, Respect the mountain, integrity first. Go to ground school, get standards-based training. Say yes, you'll never have to do it for the first time again. Pra pack a first aid kit, practice radical self-care. Also, have a good guide. Find role models, mentors, and teachers. Rope together, find your community and be a contributing member. Imagine the view, create your vision and hold it steady. Know where your feet are, current reality changes constantly. Have fire starter. Marketing keeps you warm at night.
And then blaze your own trail, create your own opportunities. Pack your trash, clean up your messes. Stay attuned to the weather, do frequent environmental scans, track your patterns, your success is predictable. At summit, risks become rewards. Take it in and give thanks. In closing, I'd like to share a poem by David Ignatow called The Explorer. I have this mountain to climb and no one to stop me. This dangerous mountain of glaciers and gaunt cliffs and I will climb it for the sake of the living. Climb then, they call out, and die. Climb then, I answer softly, and live. I am about to begin. I am reaching for possession. Climb then, they whisper, and live. My joy is in the trees and grass, the rocks and glacial face of the mountain. My joy is skyward. My life is the opening of heaven. I have placed my foot on the mountain that I have discovered is my own. David Ignatow, The Explorer. So just to wrap up, I want to give thanks to photographer Aaron Spong. Um, he's a public school art teacher and artist. Uh, his work is available online, uh, very reasonable prices. He is just a lovely, lovely man, and I would hope that you might take a look at his website. I want to thank Mary Reynolds Thompson, my good friend and uh, mentor and, um, in and muse, for her inspiration from her book, Reclaiming the Wild Soul, How Earth's Landscapes Can Restore Us to Wholeness. Um, from the mountains chapter. And um, I'd love to stay in touch with you. The Center for Journal Therapy, the Therapeutic Writing Institute, and the Journalverse are um, organizations that we would love to invite your participation in in whatever way it works. Um, the Therapeutic Writing Institute and the International Federation of Bibliopoetry Therapy have a wonderful collegial um, interactive working relationship so when you um, you have access to both of us thank you so much for being here enjoy the conference it has been such an honor to be with you, thank you.